Dr. Jack Cooper, thanks so much for coming back onto Evolution Soup from your office in Swansea University in Wales. You are a recognized expert in shark biology with many years experience in science communication, and you've recently completed your PhD on the functional diversity of sharks through time. In our first interview, we talked about the reconstruction of the iconic megalodon shark, revealing the true size of this giant extinct predator. Today, we'll be looking at your work on the rise and fall of shark functional diversity over the last 66 million years and asking the question, are sharks going extinct? Welcome back to the show, Jack. Well, you're no stranger to documentary and television work, and we just saw you alongside Steve Backshaw on Channel 5's Monsters of the Deep here in the UK. Uh, that must have been a fun experience. Well, first of all, Mark, thanks so much for having me back. And to chat briefly about that experience, it was a tremendous experience to get to work with Steve directly and see the process of how we communicate that science to the public on an on-camera uh, interview. And it was a really great experience. We got to go to this beach, and it was very nice of them to make it look like I work at a beach. We got to stretch out the entire length of a megalodon, and we got to sort of give a scale to the size of this real life animal when it was alive. And I think it did a great job of capturing that when it was put to film. Just last year, 2024, you and your PhD advisor, Dr. Catalina Pimiento, released a scientific paper on the rise and fall of shark functional diversity through time. Jack, before we break down this research and discover just why your findings are so concerning, could you give us an overview of this paper? Yes, absolutely. So the first thing to answer is what is functional diversity? Because that's not necessarily something we throw around a lot to lay people. Generally, the short of it is that functional diversity is the diversity of ecological rows of a species, and you quantify that based on their traits, so their size of their bodies or their diets, or perhaps physiology in some cases. And all of this tells us how species capture and use uh, their resources to influence their ecosystem. And given that sharks play an enormous range of ecological roles, ranging from apex predator to filter feeder to mesopredators lower down the food chain, they naturally play a very, very big role in how our marine ecosystems function. What we want to do in this paper, ultimately, is figure out how their influence through their range of ecological roles has changed throughout the entire Xenozoic era, so from 66 million years ago, right after the KPG extinction, to the present day. And we want to see how that changes over that 66 million years to see how prehistoric sharks and their range and influence across the marine ecosystems compares to today, allowing us to sort of put their roles today into a paleontological context, you might say. And basically what we found was that shark functional diversity or the range of their ecological roles was surprisingly high for most of the Xenozoic, including right after the KPG. But after it peaked about 20 million years ago, there has been a steady and consistent decline in those range of ecological roles. And this seems to coincide with when we lose some rather significant shark species like Megalodon, which was a trophic level onto itself as an apex super predator. But what this also means is that prehistoric sharks have occupied a wider range of ecological roles than living sharks, which indicates that uh, shark functional diversity is already depleted compared to its geological past. 
And given that sharks are today amongst the most threatened invertebrates on Earth, that tells us that we are at risk of severely depleting it even more than it already is. You're known for your research work on the famed Megalodon, the giant extinct shark that continues to fascinate so many people. So how did the dynamics of the ancient oceans change after the disappearance of the Megalodon? So the oceans fundamentally changed in their ecosystems when we lost Megalodon. Megalodon, in terms of its ecological role for sharks, was what we would call functionally specialized, meaning it had a rather extreme ecological role, and that would be an apex super predator, which almost goes without saying, given how massive it is. But when we lost this apex super predator that was right at the top of the food web, we likely see nutrients are not getting to where they're supposed to go as this species was a migrator. But more importantly, we look at the effects it had on Megalodon's prey, specifically the whales it ate. And there is fossil evidence suggesting that whales actually got bigger in size after Megalodon went extinct, which suggests to us that since there was no giant sharks around to eat these whales anymore, they were allowed to swim away and get eat as much krill and get as big as they wanted. In your paper, you talk a lot about the teeth of sharks. Jack, why is the study of the teeth of these animals so useful when determining their decline? So when it comes to sharks, teeth are so important in many ways because it's often the only fossil evidence we have of these animals. Shark skeletons are typically made out of cartilage, which is much softer than something like teeth, and it decomposes after the shark dies. But the teeth are not only much harder and therefore preserve better, but they're constantly being shed by sharks throughout their lives. So we have lots and lots of teeth available to us as well. And notably, when you look at relationships between the traits that allow us to quantify functional diversity and different tooth measurements in sharks, we see that there's quite a good relationship. For example, the size of the tooth can often give us an idea of how big the shark was, or something like serrations you see on a great white shark or a tiger shark or even megalodon can tell us that it was probably eating quite large prey, something like marine mammals, or even the shape of the tooth can give us an idea of how the shark was eating. Was it slicing through flesh or was it gripping fishy prey? Or perhaps was it a filter feeder? And ultimately, when we see these relationships in living sharks, it allows us essentially to apply them to, at the very least, Cenozoic sharks, where there are a lot of living representatives of these fossil species. For example, you have ancient white shark species, ancient sand tiger shark species, or ancient tiger shark species. So basically, by measuring these teeth and seeing how they relate to certain traits, you can get an idea of what ecological role a species was playing and therefore its functional diversity. And that's something you can not only apply to sharks, but a whole range of prehistoric taxa. And what about us, human beings? Uh, how has the advent of the human animal affected the diversity of sharks? Uh, the arrival of human beings, in a nutshell, has affected sharks, and indeed all of biodiversity, tremendously. Uh, today, sharks and their closest relatives, the rays, are considered among the most threatened marine vertebrates in the oceans. About a third of all shark species are threatened of extinction, and the single biggest driver of this is overfishing. There was recent work conducted by scientists that have conducted a IUCN red list, essentially assessing their endangerment status since the 1970s. And they have found that overfishing has led to the global populations of sharks essentially halving since the 1970s. And this is probably due to overfishing killing as many as 100 million sharks every single year. And the reason we make this such a big threat is because we are removing these species in bulk and they tend to be k-selected species where they have low reproductive rates they have slow growth rates so they can't catch up or uh, get old enough to actually survive or reproduce fast enough to the rate that we are killing them 
So in short of it is, because we are taking so many sharks out of the ecosystem in one go, it's very, very difficult for populations to recover. And that's why our actions have directly caused this massive decline in sharks in the last 50 years or so. Jack, sometimes when we hear about the onslaught of human activity causing seemingly irreparable damage to our ecosystem, it makes us feel that maybe there's nothing we can do. So if this interview can be viewed as a cautionary tale, then we have to ask, is there anything we can do? Well, the good news is, despite how much the populations of sharks have crashed over the last five decades, none of the most functionally unique or specialized species have gone extinct. And those are the species that have traits that are the most dissimilar or the most extreme in terms of sharks. So your filter feeders, your warm-blooded species, or your very biggest shark species. And because they're so important for the ecosystem, conserving these species in particular will allow us to maintain what's left of shark functional diversity. And there's a number of ways we can address this. We can expand marine protected areas, for example, to cover hotspots of functional richness or range of ecological roles, or even uh, habitats that we know contain the most unique or specialized shark species. A lot of that is going to do with ensuring that we get the right policies across based on who you vote for. And some governments are certainly going to be better than others at this. But instead of pointing fingers, it's probably best to actually help push those policies forward with the science and have that science be what leads those policies. For example, quotas and overfishing or expanding marine protected areas, like I said before. And generally, by setting up those areas and pushing those policies, we can take the right steps to at least mitigating some of this enormous damage we've done. Well, it's been great catching up with you again, Jack, and I'm very grateful that you've been able to take the time to come back onto the show today. And I'm also grateful to see that you're getting more TV and documentary work. So what about future projects, more research papers, or perhaps we'll see you in more documentaries? I sure hope so. So I have just finished my PhD and I would like to continue prospects in science communication, which has very much become a passion of mine since doing my PhD. Obviously, I had a lot of heavy lifting done for me by a big giant shark, which a lot of people tend to find uh, quite an attractive prospect to communicate about. And I've done quite a lot of work, thanks to the big fella, as well as appearing in the Steve Batchel documentary. I also contributed to an animation by TED-Ed, which your viewers can watch on YouTube and currently has over 1.2 million views. Looking at the similarities with great white shark teeth, scientists estimate that megalodons might have stretched up to 20 meters, three times longer than great whites. And during their reign, which began around 20 million years ago, megalodons lived just about everywhere, with individuals also potentially undertaking transoceanic migrations. I've taken part in the Skype a Scientist program for one of my friends from uni at her school, and I appeared in a documentary called Giants, which can be viewed on Curiosity Stream by your North American viewers, in which I talked about sharks and megalodon with the presenter Dan O'Neill. In terms of my research, uh, there is a couple more papers coming out. There's still one paper from my PhD that needs to be published. There is at least one more megalodon project I'm working on. And there is also work on a great white shark that I'm involved in that I can't get into too much about, but I hope to see that out later this year. And with all that ahead of me, and hopefully a lot more science communication, I'm really looking forward to any new and exciting horizons that might come from that. Absolutely. And, and no doubt, Jack, also continuing to work with Catalina, is that right? Uh, yeah, if she'll still have me. I've been I've been with her for many years now since my master's, and I'm very, very privileged to call her a friend and a mentor. 
So I, I will be a, I will follow her into a burning building if it's in the name of science, and I'm happy to stick around with her for as long as she'll have me. Jack Cooper, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure to be back.